moment um, of deep reflection to remember and pay respects to those that we have lost recently. I would also like to acknowledge the loss of Kelly King. Kelly dedicated 25 years to the Six Nations of the Grand River elected council. Our thoughts are with her and her, her family during this difficult time. Let's have a moment. Thank you. So number one, identification of media. Do we have any media here? Oh, Turtle Island. Thank you. Adoption of the agenda. Is there any changes or additions to the agenda? If not, can I have a mover? Moved by Audrey, seconder. Second by Elena. All in favor. Anybody opposed? See none. Carried. Let's go to number four, um, delegations. Uh, Mike Ciccone, Ciccone, <laughs> an Indigenous and External Relations Manager. The presentation uh, for, from SEED. So if you guys wanna come up and you can introduce yourselves. Can you just push the button? Then you're. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Mike Ciccone. I'm the Indigenous and External Relations Manager for Ontario at uh, Imperial. And we're here today representing the, uh, the seat committee um, that, uh, that administers the funding that Imperial provides for education, training, and uh, employment development for Six Nations members. With me today is Jody Grant. Um, there were intended to be other committee members uh, joining us today, but schedules don't always work out uh, in our favor. There may be um, some of them online, but uh, I don't know that any of them were able to um, to join. The other committee member we do have in the room is is Carolyn Francis. She's the HR manager at our Nanticoke uh, refinery. I'll let Jody introduce herself. Okay. Hello, I'm Jody Grant. I'm the refinery manager at Arnanta Coke plant. Um, you know, I want to start uh, by saying on behalf of Imperial and our Arnanta Coke team, congratulations to Chief Hill and to the new councillors and to the returning councillors as well. Um, we're very um, proud and appreciative of the relationship that we have between Imperial and Six Nations. And uh, it's been going on for about 22 years now. Our seed agreement's been going on at least for 22 years. And so we're very proud of that. And um, just want to say, um, also we're really looking forward to continuing to work together with the community in supporting of education and training opportunities for the Six Nations members, as well as in increasing our employee awareness of the Six Nations history and culture and including um, seeing representation from the community in our workforce, um, as well as working with uh, your development corporation on potential business opportunities. So thank you for giving us a few minutes and I'll pass it back over to Mike. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Jody. Um, we do have a, uh, a brief presentation to run through so I can talk through that. Okay, Shirley, can you um, put that up? Thanks. You can go to the next slide. So the seed agreement has been in place uh, since 2002. So we're into over 22 years of, uh, of the agreement. It's been renewed uh, a total now of, of four times with the most recent renewal. And that fun funding started out at $250,000 a year. And uh, as of for 2023, it's up to $345,000 a year. And there's a, a CPI adjustment in there that um, gets applied each year. And so that's how it's gotten to, to that number. Um, and that, that agreement was jointly developed in 2002 and, uh, and has allowed us to have collaborative relationships um, 
uh, with Six Nations Education, Employment, and Training Organizations, um, and contributed over six or nearly six million six million dollars in initiatives um, over these years. Uh, <clears throat> And it's the it's really the care and dedication of the the seat committee members that uh, that makes all of this all of this work. And we do have represent representatives from both Six Nations and Imperial on this committee, developing programs that focus mainly on uh, on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, as well as trades, and encouraging Six Nations members to acquire the skills and qualifications that are that are needed to uh, to have careers. Um, at places like our refinery uh, at Nanacoke uh, or others in the manufacturing industry. And the committee is responsible for allocating and stewarding that, uh, that annual funding. Go to the next slide. In terms of governance, uh, the committee meets at least quarterly, more often than that for sure, to, uh, to make sure that things are moving along, uh, review the programs and expenditures, and we make decisions through discussion and consensus. And I've been working with the committee coming up on two years now, and I'd say that is absolutely uh, how it works. I don't think we've ever had a disagreement as to what the right programs were to fund or uh, or to how much. Um, I did want to give you an overview of the, of the committee members for 2023 because we've had some changes um, this year since the beginning of the year. Uh, Carly Martin from GREAT has joined. Um, Rebecca Jamison from uh, Six Nations Polytechnic has been on the committee. I don't know for how many years, but I, I don't say, want to say from the beginning, but she has been around it for a long time. So we rely on her, uh, her guidance and experience to help us quite a bit. Um, and uh, Jessa, sorry for the spelling mistake on the slide, Jessa Late has just joined as well from the Grand Area District School Board that provides us a connection to those students that are... Um, are off or outside of the reserve at schools. And then Anne Noyes um, from the uh, Six Nations District Schools um, represents the uh, the elementary schools. From the Imperial side, there's myself as, as co-chair, um, Michelle Camilleri, who couldn't be here today, who's our environment and regulatory lead for the Nanacoke Refinery, and Carolyn, who's sitting at the, uh, at the back. And I would note that right now, because of a couple of changes that we had this year, we are, uh, Still trying to uh, to determine who from the Six Nations members will fill the the co chair role on uh, on that side. So that's a discussion that we'll have um, with those members to see who's who's interested in uh, in taking on that responsibility. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the goals are really for the committee to effectively use the funding to achieve the objectives um, that are in the agreement and support programs that are engaging for the uh, for the students and for the benefit of the Six Nations community. We want to take a look at what um, the results are though of those programs are to make sure that we're uh, we're being successful and to continue working with uh, with Imperial and the Six Nations community to to achieve those goals. So we're always open to hearing new thoughts and ideas about programs that uh, that could benefit the students at all levels of the learning journey from elementary school through um, secondary, post-secondary and, and job skills training and, and up to employment as well. So that's that's all we had to share with you today. Just want to provide a, a brief overview and happy to answer any questions or, uh, or hear any comments or feedback. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have Greg, then Audrey. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for coming in, and uh, thank you for our for your help. The um, the question I had was, um, uh, you've been doing like pretty much this uh, funding since two thousand and two, correct? Um, how many uh, First Nations? Um, well, what's the percentage of First Nations employment you have at Manicoke? Do you know? I don't know the exact percentage, but I'd say that it's uh, in terms. Of it is roughly around um, three to five percent. It's in that range right now. And and how do you gauge uh, success of your of your program since two thousand and two to two thousand and twenty three? Is there a way you gauge um, success? So we've just uh, 
implemented within the committee some we call them KPIs, performance indicators, to uh, to see where we're where we're seeing those results. It's a difficult thing for us to measure directly um, when you talk about you know elementary students, et cetera. But I think one of the one of the metrics for us is where we see someone um, becoming employed at at our refinery. And I, I'd share an example that we had this past summer where we had a, a summer student from Six Nations who was taking engineering at uh, Western University. That's the first time that we've had an engineering student from Six Nations uh, be able to fill that role that, that the seed funding supports. Um, and uh, I know that he speaks highly of his experience and I know that the leadership at, uh, at the refinery speaks highly of his contributions, so much so that they've, uh, they've asked him to accept the position to come back again next year in his uh, after he finishes his second year of engineering so I think that's that's getting close to ultimately what what the goal is but also seeing the interest in the uh, in the students in the stem programs that are offered things like uh, mad science summer camp for elementary students um, we've had students from the uh, from the high schools from from SNP steam Academy come to the refinery to hear people talk about what the the kind of roles and career options are and be able to be out and see what what the refinery actually is. So we get good feedback on that as well. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Audrey. Welcome. Thank you for the presentation. I just want to know if you are or would provide AI uh, information to uh, people who come in from Six Nations to accept the program or some kind of um, a workshop so that they can discern what is AI and what's helpful and mm. what's not helpful and what could be dangerous. That's something we can we can take a look at. And it's here now. For sure, yeah. It's, it's not something that 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 Imperial uses, but I think that uh, it would be it would be a good thing for the students to understand the the benefits and the risks. I think is what you're talking about. Exactly. Uh, certainly, we see that we see both of those sides as well. Yeah, that's probably something we could share the benefits, the risks, like to our our business. Yeah, and you see the picture on the on the commercials, you know, with Wayne Gretzky, and then he's talking to his younger self. Oh, I haven't seen that AI. It's you can tell that it's AI, but it's going to be getting so good that I think in the future you're not going to be able to tell. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see people not um, use it for negative things and to be able to um, have safety safety thought around it. It's okay to use AI in some things, but there are things you shouldn't use it for. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's okay. definitely Thank positives you. and negatives. Yeah. I have Helen. Uh, yeah, when they when they brought impair when they made the uh, Roberta Jameson was chief when the the agreement came into place in 2002. And the intention was to try and turn, get our students interested in, in engineering in those high level positions. That's what it was for. But over the years, they found out that there wasn't too many of our students going into those type of things, engineering and all that. So they kind of lowered it and started applying it to other things. But it was intended to be engineering and high level, but I don't know why our a lot of our students don't go into those like engineering and different things like that. I don't know because it's been going on for years. I, I think it's something that we need to look at as to why nobody seems to be taking those type of courses. But that's what it was for. And it's unfortunate that it uh, had to morph into other things, but it's still a good program. I mean, a lot of kids are benefiting from it. Yeah, and that is still our... Our, our target is towards students that are into the, the more technical fields because that's where there's opportunities for them to to work at a refinery and and be close to uh, be close to the community as well um, and we and we have you're right we have opened up sometimes the, the scholarship programs that are available we haven't limited them to being engineering students um, we've opened them up to business students environmental science um, those types of things that that still are opportunities that uh, that the company would offer. But um, I, I know we were all excited when we had an engineering student join us 
last year, and uh, and we hope to see that continue and and for him to, to spread the word about his experience um, through that uh, through that work. Um, and I think a lot of it is just awareness. There are there are many people in the community that don't know that the refinery um, is there and what types of opportunities there are for uh, community members. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. We're definitely interested, have the same interests with the engineering students. We have expanded it to trades as well and trying to, though, to keep it with the areas that we would offer employment in, so like environmental, et cetera. Um, and hopefully some of the programs, like having the students um, in high schools come to the site where we have a variety of different employees talk to them about what they do helps pique some of that interest um, to go into those programs in school. Okay, I have Hazel and Audrey, then we'll wrap it up. Yes, I would like to ask um, <clears throat> with regard to this type of program where you're whereby you're working within the uh, education component of our young students, et cetera. I know a lot of students, once they graduate from grade 12, are more interested in going and getting a job. So with that, have you ever considered establishing uh, an apprenticeship program whereby a grade 12 graduate would go into an apprenticeship program into your company and they would be paid some as they learn. And it could be, you know, maybe four year apprenticeship program because it seems to me what, what I've seen is that students, once they're graduating from grade 12, want a job immediately. And maybe they're tired of going to school, I don't know, but it would be something to consider, I think, because um, I know apprenticeship programs used to be really a big thing whereby a person would graduate, um, get sponsored by somebody to go into an apprenticeship program and therefore once that was done, they graduate with their trade papers. Thanks. A couple, a couple of things I'd say to that, that uh, one, and Jody might add more detail to this, but in terms of apprenticeship opportunities at the refinery, they are limited just in terms of the type of work that we have our employees do. Um, that said, through the support we provide to um, Six Nations Polytechnic and GREAT, I think there are opportunities for students to participate in apprenticeship programs that they support and not directly with the refinery. Um, so that, that's one side of it. The other is, as Jody was mentioning, we have started to open up positions for um, trades and, and operator type roles for people who are in post-secondary education, but not necessarily decided on what career they're going to have. So they have an opportunity to come in and experience some different roles through a, a summer role. Um, and and be able to decide uh, that way. Yeah, what I was going to add is maybe we can do a better job of communicating like the co-op and internship programs. And so we do, like Mike was saying, engineering students, also students that um, go to Mohawk for um, uh, the course that we hire for operators out. They, they both have co-op programs. And so letting students know that we have those types of programs where you go to school, you come work for us for the summer, or some of them are like a year long internship or an 18 month internship. So it's possibly something when the students come to visit the refinery, we can share some of those connections that we have um, because they get paid for those co-ops and the internships. Yeah. Audrey? And my question is taking that down to the elementary grades so that they can get the seeds planted then and so that you can hit them with all the um, material that you have, as well as all of the different methods of, of communicating. You know, do you have videos that they can see? And so they get interested in being an engineer and all the other, other jobs that you have. And I, I think you got to start earlier. Yeah, that's a good point, because that is really where it, where it starts. Start earlier and sustain it through sustain so that they the interest, maintain absolutely. That, that, that interest. And, um, we have we do support programs at all of those levels, and hopefully that's what starts to uh, starts to come along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been talking about you got to get them interested in the math and science. Absolutely, like you said, in elementary school. I can follow. I'm talking about more in depth than that. You have exactly um, what it is that people do, and make a video of that. 
you know, I, I've been an educator for 42 years and those programs come in, everybody uses them for science and science fairs and this, that. But if you're looking for engineers, you got to start telling people or young students what engineers do, uh, what kinds of uh, money they can make from that. It's a high paying job. Mm -hmm. And how long is it going to take them to get there? And what types of things they can offshoot from, branch out from. So I think the more that we give them pamphlets and, you know, um, anything that, that's uh, visual for us, as well as videos or live streaming of send us a link type of thing. Mm -hmm. Day in the life of an engineer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, very much appreciate that feedback. And we capture it's probably something that the team can can work on about, you know, how do we get into those elementary schools and share like you were saying. Um, before we wrap it up, I guess my question is the data. Even from the past five years, how what's the data look like? Has it more kids? Has it been more programs? I guess that's what I would like to see is how many um, kids are going to the programs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's something like Mike was saying with the recent signing of the agreement, um, weaving in the key performance indicators. We haven't had those before. So we wanted to get those in so we can start measuring that and see where do we have success? Where do we need to make some changes? And so I don't know if you have any now, but I know it's something, like I said, we wove in so we can start looking at, at that in the future. Yeah, I think what we've got right now is, is a little bit more anecdotal and maybe a couple of data points, things like the Mad Science Summer Camp that is you know, wait listed every year and we added more weeks to it uh, this past summer. So there's there's an interest there from, uh, maybe it's more the parents, but the children as well to be in, in those types of uh, programs in the summer. And then for our applications for scholarships and, and jobs have started to increase as we're doing a better, but can still get better job at communicating that those opportunities are available and making sure that the community members know that uh, that they, they have those um, jobs and, and scholarships they can apply for. Yeah, which is something we struggled with for a little while. How do we get those um, summer job, co-op jobs, and full-time job opportunities out there so people know that we're hiring? Um, I think, like Mike said, we've done a better job of it recently. But yeah, it was an area we we're focusing on. So we okay. hope to be coming back you know, with our report on this year with, with some data on uh, on participation and any I'm glad I'm glad to see that because I had to drop off my granddaughter for the mad science and there was a lot of kids in there so yeah. I know it was running a few times so yeah I just wanted to know um, the data on that but all the other things another last question Leslie hi <clears throat> thank you for coming this evening as well my question is um when you talk about engineers right as as as, as it relates to Imperial SO what kind are you talking about? What was the title for that? Sure. Um, so we hire a combination of chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, materials, uh, environmental, instrumentation, electrical. It's pretty much all of them. The, I guess the, the core ones would be chemical, chemical mechanical. Chemical and mechanical are core, but there's a whole variety that we hire. Okay. Yeah, and and when you look at the the percent of our population of engineers, mm -hmm. it would be majority chemical and then mechanical, yeah. like Mike said. But we do hire a bunch of the other fields as well. And like our our summer student, he was studying I think structural or civil engineering. Civil engineering. And we hire those as well. So there's a large variety. Okay. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay. Again, thank you for coming in tonight um, to present. Um, I have a motion, the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council accept the 2022 seed report as information. Is there a mover? Audrey, is there a seconder? Leslie, all in favor? Anybody opposed? See none, carried. Okay, thank you. thank you. Have a great night. We'll move on to uh, number two, the First Nations Drinking Water Settlement Update and Next Steps. Are they in the waiting room? Shirley? No, they are not. Good advice. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll move on until they come. It says 635. So let's go to number five. 
24. Uh, adoption of the general council minutes from October 24th. Is there any questions? If not, is there a mover? Moved by Melba. Seconder. Audrey, all in favor? <laughs> we oppose, see none carried. Okay, let's go to number six. Number six is the, the Gleeblands. Just want to do a little update. Um, I went there uh, last Thursday, but also um, before that, we know that um, uh, Chief Mark Hill went with um, Greg there. When was that, Greg? Two weeks ago? Two weeks ago also. So when I went um, there, I had um, Aaron Hill, who works with um, Six Nations Police, and the M MCART worker, um, Bryce LaRoche was there, myself and Greg, um, two Six Nations police officers were there, and two MARC units from Brantford City Police were um, on standby there. So when we went into um, the Glebe lands, we encountered seven people who are living in the camp camper trailers. Two of them identified as First Nations and one identified as um, Six Nations band member. There was a tented area that appeared to be used, but no one was there at the time. There was also a place they called the hole <laughs> that was a deep pit like area where they told um, they were living there also. There was debris sites and um, all over um, the Glebe lands, um, household items, garbage of various shopping carts um, were also seen. Uh, the called the Brantford City Police to inquire about the um, houseless outreach team that was recommended um, by Chief Montour, but unfortunately at the time they're unable to come on scene with us. If I can have the um, pictures. So as you can see, these were some of the pictures um, that are at the Glebelands. And this is, um, we're going to, Aaron's gonna go back at the end of the week um, to see how, how many have left and need a discussion to do um, the cleanup in the area. Is there any, um, anything you wanna add, Greg? Oh uh, yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh... Chief Mark Hill and also Sherry Lynn uh, uh, for treating these uh, um, squatters as you might might they're known they're known as but they um, appreciate that uh, both chiefs um, treated them with respect um, gave them information because we as you know we're not just trying to just throw them out what we're trying to do is also provide services for them as well. A um, couple of things is that, um, yeah, some some of the inhabitants have, have left or have the appearance that they have left uh, since uh, Mark, uh, Chief Bark had, and myself had uh, visited. Um, the, the other thing, too, is that um, they did ask for an extension of a couple of days, um, which I think uh, were amenable, too, but um, but I can see that um, they all admitted, too, as well as that they were there they knew they were there illegally. And um, we also saw some of the trailers had already been uh, locked up. They had chains on them with locks. Um, one, one of the rumors is the fact that um, um, most of these trailers are not owned by First Nation members. Um, they're owned by non-First Nation members. So, and uh, as Chief said that, um, that we could only see that we're two, two of our members were there. Thank you. Is there an, um, any, Melba? Will there be a follow-up as to how they 
will be taken care of housing wise will there be a follow up um yes they're going out again this week just to make sure um who's there and that they have all the resources again that'll be the third time thanks you're welcome leslie i on sunday i i went and i went through there too to see what it looked like and uh just drove through and some people came up on ATVs and asked, who are you or what did I want? So I just stopped looking for the river. <laughs> well, I wasn't. I was just looking around. And they um, uh, they were afraid that it was police. And I said, no, I'm from Six Nations. I'm just looking through, like driving through. And then I went and exactly where all those, where you showed all those things. When you say squatters, I think that's more appropriate than to say homeless because what I see are high-end vehicles, uh, four by fours, um, big vehicles attached to those, not attached, but as a residence that are there. On leaving, uh, I would say, I, would, I can't assume or, or assert or say why these other vehicles showed up, but they pulled in front of the vehicle and I had to go another way out as opposed to going out the way I had come in. And that was okay. And then I was met by two more big vehicles. So I, the only thing I thought about is when you are ready to have them removed, make sure you are you have all those entrances from the park area all blocked off. Like, so you can't have others coming in to refortify or stand with them. Yeah, that's all I just want to add that. Okay. Anything? Nobody else? Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, Hazel? Regarding the uh, trailers, if they're owned by non-natives, um, then those will have to be moved out of there as well. So who is a contact to find the people that own those and have them removed? You just know that or not? No? No. So, and I think um, next week, um, this coming week, when um, Aaron goes in, I'll have another follow-up um, for council where it's at and mm -hmm. the next steps. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Let's go back to um, our guests for the First Nations Drinking Water Settlement update. Laura Edwards. Oh. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Laura Edwards from JFK Law, and I've been working with Robert James for the past year to provide advice on the drinking water um, settlement. And Nathan Wright asked me here today to give a broad uh, update on this file and the next steps for Six Nation to consider. Uh, I did draft a briefing note for council this morning and sent that to Nathan. I'm not sure if it uh, made its way to council for distribution. But uh, yes, if it not, it did. Okay, great. Yes, it, it will cover everything that I have to speak to this evening as well. So you'll have that for your reference as we move through. Okay, the floor is yours, Laura. Okay, great. Um, so I know everybody's heard about the drinking water clash action settlement, which was settled in uh, 2021 and addressed broadly Canada's failure to provide safe and clean drinking water on reserves. And the terms of the settlement agreement set out who was eligible to join the class action and who could get compensation. And in late 2022, uh, I believe it was October, we were contacted by Six Nations uh, to give advice on how to join the class action because at that time, Six Nations was not included on the list of impacted First Nations. And to be eligible to join the class action, Six Nations needed to be on that list. And in order for members who were living on Six Nations Reserve during the claim period, which was November 20th, 1995 to June 21st or 20th, 2021, um, Six Nations needed to be on the list of impacted First Nation for those members to be able to be eligible for compensation and to apply. 
So at that time, we uh, advised Six Nations that they needed to get, gather more evidence about drinking water, uh, long-term drinking water advisories provided either by Six Nations itself to its members, Health Canada or um, Indigenous Services Canada or Ontario Public Health during the claim period and to provide all of that to the claims administrator. And the claims administrator would take that and consider whether or not to add Six Nations to that list of impacted First Nations. So throughout the fall of last year, we worked together to put that application package together. And in January of this year, January 2023, Six Nations did submit that application to the claims administrator. And unfortunately, in July of this year, the claims administrator responded and denied Six Nations application to join the class action, stating that there wasn't enough evidence um, to support their application to be an impacted First Nation under the class action settlement agreement. And there was a time that Six Nations could have appealed that decision, but that ended in September on September 8th. So as it stands, Six Nations is not on the list of impacted First Nations and cannot be added. So Six Nations as a band is not eligible to join the class action or to get any uh, band level compensation. And any Six Nations members who were living on Six Nations lands during the claim period are also not eligible to join the class action. Some members could be eligible if they were living on um, the reserve land of other First Nations who are on that list of impacted First Nations and if they meet the other um, eligibility criteria, but otherwise broadly, uh, Six Nations and most of its members won't be eligible for compensation under the class action settlement agreement. Um, so I'll pause there maybe to answer any questions before I move on to the next steps um, that I propose in that briefing note. Okay, is there any um, questions I have, um, Greg? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Uh, the uh, question I had was, uh, we've been uh, continually uh, encouraging our members to, um, to apply. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the reasons we want them is because they had said that uh, there wasn't really a, a need here on our reserve when actually the, the opposite is true. When, you know, no one can use uh, well water, no one can use, we have to, we have to buy water. So by having all our members um, apply, would that not be beneficial in terms of um, giving the data to the, um, uh, to the administrator that, that there is a definite need here? Unfortunately, no, because Six Nations is not on the list of uh, impacted First Nations. It won't matter how many members apply because Six Nations is not on that list. Previously, we had advised that members should still apply and add as much evidence as they can of those drinking water advisories to show that Six Nations is an impacted First Nation. But because now the administrator has said no, it won't matter whether members provide this information or if Six Nations does, they are just off the list. Um, I have Audrey. Oh, welcome. I just wanna know if you have responded back to all the Six Nations members who put in applications uh, to be part of this class action lawsuit. Have they been informed that they're not going to be accepted and the reasons for it? You mean the members who have made applications to the claims administrator? They should be informed by the claims administrator, but um, I'm not privy to who's applied and, and what the process is internally for the claims administrator to give that feedback. So I'm not sure when they will hear, but they should get a response from them stating why they aren't eligible. Um, and are you able to send out a copy of the letter with uh, no names on it? The copy of the letter rejecting for uh, Six Nations application? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, well, I, I did draft a community uh, information notice for Nathan Wright and 
if if council wishes, that letter could be attached and just have all of the names removed from it. Um, I don't see why that couldn't be done, but that would be up to uh, council to decide if they want to distribute that material. Um, I got Nathan. Yeah, just a point of clarification. Uh, Laura is not the administrator. She's uh, our legal counsel uh, who's been helping us guide us through and uh, she's been good enough to draft and it's in your packages as well as the community notice kind of going through and explaining where it's at uh, just from that legal perspective. So also wanted to get your eyes on it tonight and, and get that approved so we can get that out uh, on our comms network uh, as early as tomorrow. Hazel, did you have something? Hazel? I was thinking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this kind of reminds me of like the um, class action suit that had to do with day school things. And did Six Nations have to sign in order to be on there? Or did somebody make the decision that Regardless if they did come in a little bit later, they're still ineligible. What kind of information are they looking for? Because uh, only speaking for myself, living at our home for over 50 years, all we ever did was buy water, buy water, because a well, a well was not good. A drilled well was not good. So we couldn't use that water, so we've had to buy. And that is expensive after over years, say 50 years of buying water. Mm -hmm. What does that prove? Like, what, do you, what kind of proof are they looking for? It seems to me like uh, as simple as having to buy water that long. And I know a lot of neighbors, you'd see the trucks pulling in to bring the water there as well. <laughs> that should stand for something. I guess what I'm... You know, they always say have a solution. Well, I'm trying to think of what is our solution if somebody's told us we were we're ineligible. It just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Just so I'm clear, your question is um, who decided that Six Nations was ineligible and what the next steps would be to address the ongoing drinking water issues? If I can summarize it broadly, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so the claims administrator decided that Six Nations was ineligible as an impacted First Nation. To be an impacted First Nation, a First Nation's lands, so their reserve lands, needed to be subjected to a long-term drinking water advisory for a period longer than a year during the claims period, and the claims period was November uh, 20th, 1995 to June 20th, 2021. And so we worked with Six Nations to gather as much evidence of drinking water advisories together as we could and submitted those to the administrator and they determined that it was not enough evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that the drinking water class action settlement was quite limited um, in terms of who could participate. Uh, there was some debate around whether or not public, uh, it was only public systems or private wells that could have a drinking water advisory attached. It could be interpreted both ways. So we took the opinion of private wells were part of the drinking water settlement. And as long as there were drinking water advisories that were broadly applied to a bunch of wells, that should suffice. And my understanding was from the claims administrator's perspective, they didn't get enough evidence of those types of drinking water advisories to put Six Nations on the list of impacted First Nations. That doesn't mean that Six Nations doesn't have a valid claim and that these drinking water issues aren't severe and problematic. It's just under the terms of this settlement agreement alone, Six Nations is not eligible. And in terms of moving forward, um, on the briefing note that was distributed, the two avenues I see for Six Nations really are to come up with an engagement plan directly with Canada to find ways to get you know, more centralized water systems in place and to address the situation with private wells in the immediate future. 
but you could also launch your own claim to address this issue and to try and get money from Canada to fix these problems. The only issue with launching your own claim, of course, is the expense and the uncertainty of knowing how it will go. Uh, and you never know how much money you'll actually get. Uh, but these two options aren't mutually exclusive. You could start uh, developing your own engagement plan and strategy and getting Canada involved while also launching a claim and then using that claim to put pressure on Canada to provide the money for the needed infrastructure faster. Uh, Cynthia? Yeah, can you uh, clarify your briefing note, page one? Yes. Um, six nations of the Grand River is not eligible to join the settlement because mm -hmm. it is not on the list Im of impacted First Nations and the claims administrator has refused to add Six Nations. Could you clarify that? And then on page two, it talks, it talks about there was um, Six Nations submitted and could appeal, but didn't appeal. And, and there it said it because it had not received enough evidence to demonstrate Six Nations eligibility. There's two, things identified there and I don't know if it seems to me in the first instance did we fail to meet a deadline for submission of our application no you you didn't miss any deadlines to submit an application to join the list of impacted first nations so um I'll just back it up and address your first question because it will help with the second so the settlement agreement would only allow um, First Nations as a, at a band level to join the class action if it was on a list of impacted First Nations. And an impacted First Nation was a First Nation whose lands were subject to a long-term drinking water advisory that lasted then longer than one year during the claim period. And the claims administrator and class action uh, council, they came up with this list at the time uh, that the settlement was was struck when the agreement was made uh, in, I think it was September 2021, but it might have been a bit earlier than that. Um, but recognizing that some First Nations might not have been on that list initially, whether it's just because those records weren't available or if they had been missed otherwise, they could any First Nation could still apply to the claims administrator to be added to the list of impacted First Nations and they needed to provide evidence of drinking water advisories that lasted longer than one year that were applied to First Nations land during the claim period. So that is what Six Nations did. So from October to mid-January, I understand there was an effort to collect as many drinking water advisories as were in your records and to put these into uh, an affidavit, which was sworn by a uh, previous chief hill, and that was submitted to the claims administrator for their consideration at the end of January. And then the claims administrator in July said that it was not enough information, and there was an appeal period, but uh, Six Nations did not appeal the decision. And unfortunately, I didn't receive any of that correspondence, so I wasn't able to provide advice at that time, on the appeal process or what uh, additional documents Six Nations could potentially give the administrator. Um, but now that that appeal period has passed, Six Nations is just unable to become an impacted First Nation. Thank you. And just a follow-up question, the claim period, November 20th, 1995 to June 20th, mm -hmm. 2021, mm -hmm. what determined that claim period? My understanding was that it had to do with the limitation periods around when the uh, class action uh, plaintiff First Nation filed its claim. I don't uh, recall all the technicalities around how they decided that that would be the claim period, but that is what uh, the class action council and Canada agreed to in the settlement agreement. Any other questions, comments? Okay, we have two options, the next steps. And mm -hmm. for sure, 
we can always be putting um, pressure on Canada for the first one. Yeah. Starting this. Um, the launch of claim, uh, claim to address Canada's failure to provide safe drinking water to Six Nations. Yep, Melba? Yeah, um, we certainly can't just sit by and allow them to not uh, include us in their their business concerning Six Nations drinking water. It's a terrible shame again that we are, you know, second, might as well say second class, class citizens, third world sim similarities. I think we got no choice but to take the advice of JFK law and certainly um, launch our own claim Put the pressure, as you mentioned, on Canada, because we need, it says, specific facts. We don't have those facts, so we need to do a lot of research as to mm -hmm. how this came about, how we were affected, and certainly move forward. Because if we don't, our, our people are going to continue to suffer, because as we all know, we don't have a water line through the entire reserve. So we don't want our people to continue to be impacted by this contaminated water, which is happening. And I don't know. I've heard stories over the years that certainly it affected what people, uh, body sores, you know, from bathing, uh, sicknesses, nausea, things like this. But there's no facts that we've ever gathered, I guess. So we need to do that and follow through with, with the assistance of, uh, JFK Law. Um, Helen, then Elena. Yeah, are we? How many First Nations aren't on that list? Is it only us? Oh no, it's it's not only you that is excluded. There are other nations that aren't on the list. I I couldn't give you a number, but certainly there there are other nations that are excluded. Um, and I also want to qualify our advice to launch a claim uh, by saying that you, you could do this, but uh, JFK, because we don't know all of the specific facts around drinking water with Six Nations, we would have to do research with you to uh, determine the strength of the claim, like do a pre preliminary claim analysis first and provide you with litigation budget. Um, we wouldn't want you launching a claim, of course, that potentially uh, couldn't win. I don't think that would be the case, but I did want to qualify that. Well, just to confirm what kind of water we have, I was told yeah. 40 years ago that my well was contaminated. And I'm sure there's, and I know there's a lot of other people in our community who were told the same thing. Yeah. So I'm just curious as why they never included wells and cisterns when they first start talking about filing a, a lawsuit like this. Who made the decision to just go with the uh, um, well water advisories? I wasn't. I was told not to drink my water. I wasn't told to boil it. Mm -hmm. That's totally different. So who made the decision to just go with well water advisories? Yeah. So the class action council and Canada together would have made the decision when they negotiated their settlement to only accept official drinking water advisories from governing bodies, whether those were indigenous governing bodies or Canada or a public health agency. Um, and my understanding is, is that for private wells or cisterns, if there was a drinking water advisory uh, from any of those institutions that were applied broadly to a reserve for one more than one year during that claim period, that would have been accepted as evidence to add a First Nation to the list of impacted First Nations, but they were just quite specific on who could join and how and what these drinking water advisories had to look like. And that was completely up to class council in Canada. Go ahead, Elena. Thank you, Laura, for all the information. And I'm really sure the community appreciates it. I. Uh, I think on a daily basis, I've been hearing from community members that are concerned about this and application. So this is very useful information and I would be willing to move 
Um, so your recommendation uh, to instruct uh, JFK to complete a preliminary analysis of the claims potential and to develop a litigation budget for the council's consideration. Is there a seconder? Melba? Is there any other questions? It's on the floor. Um, Cynthia? Sorry, Elena, they, they had uh, <clears throat> two recommendations. One was to develop a strategy for future negotiations, and the other was to come up with a uh, a budget and impact and an analysis of how likely they were to succeed. Did you are you moving both those or one of those? I'm in their briefing note. It's it, it, I don't I didn't see on here, but on their briefing note, it's got to um. Yeah, there's there's two options, but I'm just asking if you're moving. The one about the um to come up with a budget for litigation and that. So that... that's the one I would move. I think it informs the first leverage for the first. Um, if I can clarify, the first option is separate from litigation and it focuses more on uh, government to government relationships and developing a strategy internally and then approaching Canada with this strategy to say, this is how we're engaging, this is what you need to do for our nation, and we want this sort of money for infrastructure. Um, there's also going to be a new drinking water law passed within the next six months, this, or at least tabled with Parliament, and I know that private well water will be a part of it, uh, or I can only say that to a certain extent, but I'm fairly certain will be in there. So that engagement uh, strategy would be separate from litigation, but you can do both at once and use the litigation to put pressure on Canada as part of that strategy to move it forward faster. Um, so there are two options. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, you could choose one, you could choose two, choose two, or you could try and you could do both at the same time. It really just depends on what um, council feels will be best for the community. And Chair, I don't know how you address this, but I believe both options are very important. That is, in any event, we'll need that strategy. And if there is money, more money I'm seeing coming on the table alongside of this water legislation. We will need that to take forward. But also, as pointed out, this um, litigation, just so we could get a costing on it. And again, it's leveraging leverage for the negotiation. So my, my preference, so, if you're agreeable, I, I don't know if we got a seconder, would be for both. So that was my next question. Is that okay, Elena? Yeah. And the seconder, Melba? Yeah. So we'll move those two options. Um, any other questions, comments? If not, all in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen uncarried. Wave second reading. Elena? Melba? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen uncarried. Okay. Anything else, Laura? That's everything for me today. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Have a great Thank night. You. you too. Bye now. So let's move to um, number seven. Um, Nathan will talk about um, Guyana Say, Carolonial Forest. Thanks, Chief. Um, so a few previous counselors will recall back in, I believe it was July, um, Phil Montour came to us uh, to propose that we do a plebiscite uh, in, a, uh, in conjunction with the previous election. Um, uh, and, and that plebiscite was to um, ask the community uh, whether or not we move forward with uh, uh, rules and regulations around environmental stewardship and community wellness uh, as it relates to development within our territory. Uh, for a number of reasons, um, lack of a CEO, lack of a CEPO, um, the, uh, the question could not be developed in, in time for um, the last uh, general election. Um, and just Backing up a bit, a, a plebiscite is, is similar to that of a referendum. 
uh, where you take that question out to the community uh, and ask for uh, a community vote to uh, give you guys a mandate to, to move forward on rules and regulations as it relates to environmental stewardship across the territory. Um, so I just wanted to kind of bring this back to your attention and um, uh, seek a renewed mandate uh, for this. It's basically the same wording from uh, the 58th Council's mandate. Uh, and what I will do is pull uh, the teams together to get information out to the community in a timely manner, uh, bring the legal question that will be asked to the community back to this table once it's developed to get that approved. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, provide uh, the community uh, with ample time and notice of when uh, this vote will occur um, and, and also provide uh, advanced polls uh, so there's enough time uh, to, do, uh, to do this, um, the voting as well. So uh, most of you remember that uh, uh, this was something in relation to the third line issue. Uh, that Phil Montour brought forward. There was also, I believe, a petition, uh, September 2022. Uh, and um, so basically this is more of just a procedural because the mandate is there. Uh, but I didn't want to move forward without informing uh, the newer councillors of uh, uh, this was an issue brought forward by the previous council uh, to give you guys a mandate to move forward on those rules and regulations as it relates to environmental stewardship. So I provided the briefing note, uh, as well as I think I put the um, um, the motion right in the um, letter. It's quite lengthy. It was drafted by Phil, um, but uh, I didn't want to touch it. So it would be the exact same wording of the previous uh, the previous council. And also included in there was the um, petition from September 2022. Uh, yeah, Cynthia. Um, Nathan, could you explain, I'm understanding, is it a plebiscite or a referendum to mandate this committee or group or whatever it is to develop these zoning bylaw? Is that is that what it is? Yeah, it's it's uh, basically, um, like I said, a plebiscite is a, basically a referendum. Um, and it's actually to mandate you guys uh, to um, do the, the referendum. Uh, within uh, the community. My question is, what's the timeline between, say, council agrees with this and this referendum going forward? Um, what I fear is a lot of times, not a lot of times, because there haven't been many referendums in the last decade or more that I know of, but it goes forward with, it seems, sometime great speed in that there isn't enough information out for the community, so they're aware. And I think I had said before, I would I would like us to become known as a, a council that makes knowledge-based decisions. And I think if we hold ourselves to that standard, it includes making sure the community is also aware of what they're being asked before they're asked to make a decision. That That's my concern, that there's enough time to do that. Just, just in response, I, I agree with you entirely. That's why I wanted to not rush it and take the time. My next step is to come back uh, to you with a budget timeline um, and a work plan uh, of how we're going to get to that put aside vote. Um, so that you see that timeline, you see how much it's going to cost to get this information out to the community so they are uh, informed uh, on the question that we're asking. Okay, I have Helen. Yeah, I I agree with Cynthia. I think we need to consult with the community before we even start thinking about doing a referendum to find out what they think about Oh, zoning. I mean, the years that I've been sitting here, we mentioned the word zoning. People are really going to hang us up. Um, and I know a lot of people now are talking about it because of all the businesses being set up all over the place. But I think we need to consult with the community before we even consider doing a referendum. Um, 
I agree entirely. Um, that's that's what I want to come back to you with is that work plan that uh, includes and and definitely adding uh, that element of community consultation to um, and getting their feedback too. So we can definitely add that uh, in terms of um, um, the 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 kind of question that we're asked because I just I didn't want to go out and and do it at the election time. We could have rushed it, but it would have had no setting. It would have had no context and. Um, I don't think it would have ended well. So um, definitely want to do exactly what both the, you and Councilor Jamison are saying in terms of uh, do that consultation. Uh, but I really want to come back with a plan um, based on um, and, and work with um, not only the Mother Earth Department, but our Justice Department uh, and really Trevor, um, who's our late nation builder, um, in terms of coming up with that plan, how much it's going to cost, uh, uh, as well as um, how long we're going to do that engagement. Okay, I have Audrey, then Hazel. Thank you very much. I agree with my colleagues. We've been talking for years and years to bring the community along with us, and this is now the start of it. I know that we've informed people, but we haven't really gotten what we're looking for. The health um, survey went out and the health leg legislation didn't follow it. So how can you make an informed decision if you don't know what you're talking about and you haven't read up on anything? So to assume somebody has a computer and internet is, is um, part of the planning, but you also have to get everybody else, seniors who don't have any of those modern day devices and uh, people you know, who are youth and who, who want to have their voices heard. So I agree wholeheartedly. You know, um, Hazel? Yes, I agree as well, because um, <clears throat> I was the one that brought the um, letters from the third line residents who really took issue with the fact that there was another um, big uh, cigarette factory they thought was going to be developed in the one home would have been encased by one on one side, one on the other. Not only that, I think um, all of this could also probably include um, the emissions that come from those stacks on those um, industrial areas because um, Helen told us about her new shoes going outside and they're all um, charred, I guess, eh, Helen? No, really what's happening is all that, yeah, all that stuff that's coming out of those chimneys is, you don't know how far and wide it's going and landing. So I think all of that too could be incorporated into all of this um, with zoning and taking more care for the residents because um, I know on third line again, the one mom, she won't even take her kids out even in the summer because all you can smell is the smells that are coming and afraid that, you know, if you have a baby, you certainly don't want to put a little baby in the grass to crawl around if there's all that stuff down there as well. So I think that's something that we could also add into this whole thing. And I think those community members are going to be happy to hear that we're now working on this because they've asked me, so what happened to our letters? I says, well, we did discuss it, <laughs> but they're going to be happier now. Let's just say like that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Nathan will come back with uh, the plan and we'll go from there. So the next one, um, eight, um, no meetings attended. So let's go to nine, um, scheduling. So Indigenous Service Canada, 2023 Ontario Joint Gathering, November 15th to the 16th at the Chelsea Hotel in uh, Toronto. Um, that a recommendation of the Grand River Elected Council approve for the following to attend the Indigenous Service Joint Gathering held on November 15th and 16th, 2023 at the Chelsea Hotel. On-site registration is available. Melba Thomas, Leslie Green, Cynthia Jamison, Amos Key, Helen Miller, Chief Hill, Greg Frazier, Dean Hill, Hazel Johnson, 
Elena Van Avery, and Audrey Paulus Bumbrey, and Claire Petro. Petro. Is there a mover? Leslie? Yeah, Leslie is moving and then second by Greg. And I guess the comment is, is we'll be carpooling um, also there. We won't be spending the night. So we'll be coming back um, that uh, Wednesday night. Um, Amos, you got to. We are staying on Emin Bereavement. So I'll be abstaining from these two days. Right. Late, so late calm hill. Right. Yeah. Okay, all in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen uncarried. The next one, um, number two, Chiefs of Ontario, the business supply chain mapping uh, procurement uh, projected engagement sessions to be held on November 29th uh, in Thunder Bay and the December 6th in Toronto. Is anybody wanting to, to go there? You can do. So it just says um, these discussions will focus on the current state of supply chains in First Nations businesses and the capacity and opportunities of, in procurement. Insights will be crucial in, in shaping the specialized portal and map design to house First Nations businesses to enhance their supply chain and procurement in First Nations communities across Ontario. Yeah, that's all. That's all I had was the the thing. So, yeah. So I have um Greg, who wants to go. Um, December one is that where you want to go? You can do the same comments. Okay. All right, and Nathan um, has more. Go ahead. So this was part of, uh, if you recall, uh, then Regional Chief um, Roseanne's push for an, an economic table. Uh, if you recall, when she was Regional Chief, that was one of her pillars was this economic table. Um, uh, now Chief, um, or sorry, now Regional Chief Hare has picked up that work and they've broken it off into a number of procurement areas. Uh, so this is an engagement specifically on uh, First Nations businesses being able to go into federal federal procurement, provincial procurement uh, areas, as well as that uh, large kind of third party procurement kind of piece and, and coming up with those strategies as well. Um, so as, as Claire pointed out, they're looking for feedback, they're looking for our, our, our kind of uh, input into uh, those, uh, those pieces. Um, so it'd be interesting to see also um, to see where they're at and how it fits into their broader economic plan. Uh, because broadly, if you remember, um, they became kind of a flow through. I don't know if this is still the case, but when it came to, uh, you know, I think uh, Councillor Frazier was there when they were announcing the 25 million and, and flow through dollars to go out to First Nations. Uh, this is part of that rollout uh, of that 25 million in terms of how best to get that out to, to First Nations uh, and to use to their benefit. So this is um, so it's enabling First Nations to apply for projects. Isn't that how the, the government could offer projects to them? Yeah, yeah business projects. Yep. So, Greg, you still want to go for December 6th? You're scheduled to go to the AFN. Okay. Is there anyone else? The November 29th one in Thunder Bay. Okay. We have Dean. That'll go. Leslie to Thunder Bay. Okay. Is any of you going to Chiefs of One? Is that Chiefs of Ontario or the Iroquois Caucus? The Iroquois Caucus. Okay. So I have Dean and Leslie for um, November 29th in Thunder Bay. Is there a mover? Is there a mover? 
Moved by Elena. Is there a seconder? Second by Hazel. All in favor. Anybody opposed? See none. Carried. So let's go to number three. Um, we have Santa Claus Parade. That's um, November 18th. Departing from Steyer Speedway at 10 a.m. And it's the Disney theme. So um, council will have a float or is it golf carts again? Mm -hmm. Golf carts. And we'll be giving out um, candy and stuff. So November um, 18th at Steyer Speedway, 10 o'clock. The next thing I have is scheduling edition. Uh, oh, yeah. Was there going to be a bus? You mentioned a bus the other day. For the parade? I thought you mentioned that. Um, Not a bus, but there's golf carts. Oh, golf carts. Oh, yes. I thought you meant Branford's bus. I thought you said, or was that for another function? Mm. I I'm must have sure. been dreaming again. I'm not sure, no. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm thinking of a, of a bus. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> you said something that would get the Branford bus. You know, the bus that they have all painted? Oh, not sure. Not sure? Oh. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay. Cynthia? Just a note under the scheduling number nine one, I cannot attend the fifteenth, but I can the sixteenth. Okay, can you make that so she can attend the um, not the fifteenth? Okay, so then I have another scheduling agenda. Um, Audrey uh, wants to go to the Coup Fall Assembly, November twenty first to twenty third in um, Toronto. Pardon me. Yep. Oh, sorry. Usually, Nate telling me that. I said I'm on the um, the Chiefs of Ontario Education Committee and Education here on Six Nations, and it mostly deals with post secondary, so it's quite important that I do go. I didn't have the agenda before, and it came out after. So then I saw it's all post secondary. Thank you. Okay. So is there a mover to add Audrey? Moved by Hazel, second by Leslie. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen uncarried. Okay. Um, no chief updates. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, let's do second um, reading on, on all of them from one to three. One to two for sure. One, yeah. And add the coup one. 24th, 25th, and I believe 26th also, the Secretariat Group for for Survivors, re Residential School Survivors, will be traveling to Edmonton for a conference. And I understand from an individual just yesterday, I didn't hear from Laura Arndt, who is here at Six Nations and managing the Secretariat now, um, that the counselors are not going to be available there, so they wanted to know if Ida and I could certainly attend. And as you know, I've been appointed to sit with the secretariat. Okay, so that's November 24th, 25th, and 26th? That's what I understand, yes. Is there a mover? Moved by Audrey. Is there a seconder? Amos? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen and carried. Okay, so let's do second reading on one, two, um, Audrey's um, to go to the coup assembly, and also Melba's. We have second reading. Moved by Helen. Second. <laughs> second by Leslie. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen uncarried. Okay, um, that's it. It's regarding the ISC. I think we need to decide who is going to go to those concurrent workshops. We can't all go to the same one. There's two, four in the morning, I think. So we need to decide out of all of the counselors who's going to be going to one and who's going to be going to the other. If you look at the agenda. Okay. They're all at the same time, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure. But there's... 
So if we can meet maybe tomorrow morning and everybody um, yeah, at six o'clock and have who, where you want to go and we'll go from there. Does that sound good? Yeah, because we, we, we can't all go sit in the same room. No. Okay. We'll do that tomorrow. We'll meet before we um, go in. Okay, so um, that closes the meeting, the open meeting, and a motion to adjourn. Moved by Greg, seconded by Hazel. All in favor? Opposed? Seen on carried. Thank you, community, for our um, our general council meeting, and have a great night. Thank you.